explorers, adventurers, scientists. The ones who always broadened our horizons. We were at their side when they reached the deepest point in the oceans, the highest summits of the Earth and both poles. We may think we've seen it all, that the world has its limits after all. But why do explorers, adventurers, scientists continue to venture out there again and again? Certainly not just for the record. So what do they seek? really to understand more intimately how complex and delicate our planet is to document its change and how we can affect it for the better as long as they need it we will be at their side because today the real discovery is not so much about finding new lands it's about looking with new eyes at the marvels of our planet rekindling our sense of wonder and acting here and now to preserve this pale blue dot and make it perpetual. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Libby Casey, politics and accountability anchor at the Washington Post. Our program today is part of our Climate Solutions series, where we talk with scientists, conservationists, and other high profile advocates about how governments and individuals around the world are tackling the climate crisis. Today, we're focusing on what we eat, where it comes from, and the impact of food production and consumption on the planet. My first guest is Alice Waters. She's the founder and owner of Chez Panisse Restaurant in Berkeley, California. Alice, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. You know, you've been passionate about food and community building for all of your career, and you have seen a lot of change and growth in how Americans think about food and community, but this has been a difficult couple of years between the pandemic, concerns about climate change, and the fractured and angry politics of this moment. So I'd like to hear from you, are you more optimistic or pessimistic now than you were when you started Chez Panisse? When I started Chez Panisse, I was very, very hopeful because I had been part of the free speech movement in Berkeley and we felt like we stopped the war in Vietnam. We felt like we addressed civil rights and that we could get, have free speech if we all work together. And I've really, I've never lost that optimism, really. And that's what it's about right now. I think that the pandemic has exposed the industrial food system, has awakened us in a way that nothing else could have to where, what our relation ship is with nature and our global interdependency. 
we're right there right now. You know, we're seeing that in so many ways, including how essential animals and biodiversity are uh, to health, but also the supply chain issues. So, so I'd love to hear from you what food sustainability means to you in the year 2021. Like, how do you see uh, sustainable food choices that, that people can be making right now? I think we need to all focus on where our food comes from. We need to know where it comes from. Not just what farm, but where is that farm located? <laughs> and what are they doing on that farm? And uh, there's farming that can address climate change, and there's farming that can contribute to the problems that we are having in the world. You know, a lot of primate, uh, prominent climate activists are touting plant-based diets uh, and foregoing meat and seafood as a way that people can try to make a difference on, on really an individual level on that on that daily basis. So, so what is your take on that? You know, I know you've described yourself as a cautious carnivore, and, and the menu at Chez Panisse has never been meat-heavy. I guess you could say. So, how are you seeing this movement right now? Well, I. I think we still are not understanding what really is going to uh, change our habits, because that's what we need to do to address climate. And fortunately, these are delicious solutions. <laughs> and that's, that's the part of my work that I I think is the most important. I'm not asking anyone to do something that's really difficult. I'm asking people to do what is pleasurable and and it's and it changes your life in a beautiful way. Now I'm completely engaged with public education as being the way to teach the next generation the values they need to live on the planet together. And because I've been working with the Edible Schoolyard Project for the last 25 years, and Chez Panisse has been buying food directly from farmers for almost 50 years, I feel very convinced that this is a direction we need to take, and we can do this. Tell us more about where the Edible Schoolyard Project is at. You know, it's sort of incredible to believe it's been that long uh, since it was established in the 1990s. Where, where, how is it evolving and sort of what, what are you holding firm to in terms of the basic values that you started it with? We started the project in a middle school in Berkeley with a thousand kids, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and they spoke 22 different languages at home. So when I look back, it was really a good test case for that, this project. And I brought all of my sort of Montessori ideas for teaching to the middle school um, edible schoolyard. We created a garden and we created a kitchen classroom, not to teach gardening or cooking per se, but to teach all of the academic subjects. So you might go into the kitchen classroom with your teacher and your talking about the history of the Middle East. And so you'll be cooking food from that place. You might be having pita bread and tabbouleh salad and hummus. And you'll be making that and eating that. But you're digesting the information through all of your senses. You're smelling it, you're tasting it, you're seeing the beauty of it. 
you're listening while you're cooking. And this is very important because our senses are our pathways into our minds. And very sadly, the fast food industry has really closed down our senses. We are not experiencing food in a full way. We're not touching. We're not cooking. We're just quickly eating and probably in the car. <laughs> so I'm thinking of this edible education course as something that could happen in any school. I mean, I've seen schools around the world where the garden might be across the street and the kids could cross the street and be in a classroom where they're learning math and calculating the seeds or science. They might even be in an art class or a music class. And that's the beauty of this, that at the same time that they're learning their academics, they're experiencing nature. And from my point of view, until we fall in love with nature, we will never change our habits. It's very difficult. She is the most beautiful teacher. And every child who've, who's been in the project uh, at King's School has been changed. And I know they will know always how to cook for themselves and how to take care of the land for the future. Now, this project has had a lot of visitors. Many, many, many. We do academies and we talk about this. We started six schools initially so that we could be sure that this would work in big cities, in different climates, big and small schools. And we started uh, one in LA, one in New Orleans, one in. Um, North Carolina, one in New York City, and one in upstate New York. And I have to say that it does work. It's different in every culture, but the values of stewardship and nourishment and equity and community are available, are, are there present in every program. And now we have a network of over 6,000 schools around the world. I have no idea what they're doing, but I know that they are working with these values to engage the students. Some have cafeterias that are feeding them organic, regenerative food. And some have very developed gardens. But I know that this is something that the kids love to do. Go outside. Be empowered. And again, Montessori worked with children that were sensorily deprived, that's what she said, in the slums of, Na of Naples and in India because of poverty and hunger. And she created this pedagogy that engaged the children differently and empowered them. And that's the most important part, that we have to really empower children to uh, experience uh, their, their academic subjects in a different way. Again, having that information come through all of their senses. Yeah, I've been reading, or I should say listening to uh, your autobiography, Coming to My Senses, and I've been listening to it, and it's so evocative because you read it, and so it's your voice. And one of the things you wrote was that 
I really believe that nature is everybody's mother and that this disconnection from nature is the reason for a lot of the problems we have now. H how do you see that as the root of the problem? You've just given us some illustrations of how important it is you see to connect children uh, with nature, but but why do you see that as the root of uh, many problems? Well, I just know that I grew up right at the end of the war and into the 50s. And my parents had a victory garden um, during the war. They kept that their whole lives. And I remember absolutely eating tomatoes and corn only in the summer. We never ate food out of season. Sadly, my mother wasn't a very good cook, <laughs> but we ate together at the table every night. And I tried to think about how it happened that in 60 or 70 years that we have lost our human values. How did this happen that we don't sit at the table anymore? That we don't connect to nature. I rode my bike outside all of the time when I was a kid. And it took my parents yelling at dinner time, it's time to come in. Because I loved playing outside. And children are inside. And I started to think that that it is the food that we're eating that has caused this disruption. And when we're eating fast food, we're not just eating food that's not good for us, but we're eating the values that come with the food. So we're learning that more is better, that time is money, that it doesn't matter where the food comes from. It's okay to waste. There's always more where that come, came from. And that food should be fast, cheap, and easy. And it's never been fast, cheap, or easy. Everybody has always been engaged in cooking and always willing to pay more for food than anything else because it was considered precious. And now it's just, if you don't like it, throw it out. And my parents had a little garbage can about this big <laughs> for a week. And, and they always folded up all the newspapers to be recycled and saved all their cans because of the war effort and turn out the lights when you leave the room. These were all habits that I got into and have never left me. I save all the Christmas wrapping paper and ribbons. And now my daughter does. But this is something that is dismissed by the, the advertising that is going directly through the internet, right onto our phones. And we're holding them and we believe that what is being said is the truth, but it is not the truth. And there's not healthy food if there's not healthy soil. Soil is everything. <laughs> and I, I learned that early on because I went to France when I was 19. And it was a very slow food nation at that time. And I tasted food that woke me up. I think about that wild strawberry. Everybody must know that story now because I, it, it really did. I tasted that and I said, where did this come from? And they told me I had to go up in the woods and pick it at a certain time of the year. And I was just so surprised by that.
I never thought about food that way. And all the food at that time was locally produced in, in and around Paris. I wasn't even sure that you could get olive oil in Paris at that time because it came from the south of France. And people went to the marketplace every day because they were, it was in the neighborhood. You bought food locally. You knew the person who made your bread. And people stand, st stood in line for 20 minutes to get it. It was like a social moment. And then you got your hot baguette. And I loved that, the hot baguette, and I held it. And when I came home, I wanted to eat like the French. And that has been the focus of my life, is how to bring beauty into my everyday existence. And I know that food can do that. And it's mm -hmm. about staying in, in step with nature. Now that's something that I that the fast food industry says, oh, you can have anything anytime. Well, there is no way to have ripeness unless you're close to the tree where the fruit is picked. Because that cannot be shipped. That has to be right then. Alice, how important are these conversations about local food and sustainability to our broader discussion about achieving climate change goals? You know, as we watch what's happening at the COP26 summit in Glasgow, there was a day that was specifically focused on nature and sustainable land, but but, but there isn't as much of a focus on food systems and the production of food. So how do you see that as an important part of this larger discussion? I think it's the most important part. I think we have to take that universal of food. We all eat or should all eat every day. And education is the other universal. We all go to school or should. So if we take those two things together, we can really change the world. And I have seen this happen. Just imagine if the public school system decided to reimburse school lunch for schools that purchase the food from local organic regenerative farmers. What if we bought the food directly, the way that Chez Panisse has purchased food in the whole uh, farm to restaurant and farm to school movement has been doing for so many years? What if we bought directly from those people, gave them the money, not the middleman? What if we brought students out to those farms? What if we engaged them? There. But if they got to know the people and learned how, how absolutely nourishing and delicious the food is when it's just picked, that's what I'm looking to do is to really find the public school system that's willing to make this model. And I believe here in California, we have that opportunity. The University of California is a land grant university and its mission has always been to support the economy of the state of California. Well, with this kind of initiative, it could not only support the economy of the state, but it could support the values that we need, again, to live together on this planet. 
And that's the exciting part that we could bring people into farming. How many tortillas would we need <laughs> to feed everybody in the public school system? How, how much food is purchased by the public schools around the world? And wouldn't it be fantastic to give that money to the people who are doing the right thing for the planet and pulling down that carbon into the ground where it belongs? That's the amazing, <laughs> it, hopeful scenario for addressing climate is that we can, you know, fall in love with nature and with the experience of, of gathering at the table, of lighting a candle, of having a conversation, of connecting, you know, really our local communities. We've begun to do that during the pandemic. I'm just so grateful for the support of our community here in Berkeley that has come to the restaurant and picked up food. And we kept our suppliers alive by having a little farmer's market on the weekends and making boxes of food that people can buy. And I don't know, I know that the indus industrial food system believes and has made us believe that it's impossible to do this, that it's too expensive, that children don't like it, that, that it's too hard to make, that, that it's just too, you know, impossible to deal with public education. Food. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not. It's not. We can cook simply. These are, these are ways that we've been feeding people nutritious food for centuries. I've been going back into the, the, the foods of the Middle East. Who knew that we would like kale? Who knew that we'd like hummus? <laughs> Who knew we'd like Oh, we pita bread. No one. Yet children love it. And they love to make it. And so we're tapping into something that's deep inside us. Something that almost we long for. And that's why I'm convinced. And I've, I've created a book of. Uh, affordable food for schools that fits into the USDA reimbursement that has culturally diverse dishes that kids have loved during the 25 years of the Edible Schoolyard Project. And so I know that they work. And that's something that is very important to teach the the food service directives. And it's what I'm going to do, I hope, with the Institute for Edible Education at the University of California, Davis. <laughs> well, Allison, you brought us back to a point of optimism um, and, and hope. But I do have to ask you before we go, do you have an opening date, a reopening date for your dining room set yet at Chez Panisse? It looks like 2022. I mean, are we looking at January or after that sometime? We're looking in to January. Yes, we're looking to after the new year. We're just too small to do any kind of social distancing or to, we need a certain number of people cooking and in the restaurant to make it work financially. So I, I think we just have to wait. But the longer we wait, the more we're going to understand about our interdependency, our need for local food. We can't bring food from around the world. I'm hoping that we can really have a solution like Victory Gardens. I mean, the pamphlets are already printed by the government from 
World War II, they still work. And it was when we didn't have any herbicides and pesticides. We were farming naturally. And so all of those things are already available. We just need to have that, that put out as a hopeful solution. I dug up my front yard and planted a victory garden. And people have left me notes and said, I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> But well, this, Alice, thank you so much. And even you even give us that that takeaway to end on um, something that we can each imagine doing, even in my very small urban plot of land. Uh, you, you, you give me hope for what I can do as well. Um, we're all out of time, but we just appreciate you talking with us so much. I, do I have one last slide? <laughs> yes, please. My friend who's a farmer who planted in the, the space between the street and the sidewalk said, Ron Finley said, growing your own food is like printing your own money. Alice Waters, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. I'll be back in a moment with Sanku CEO, Felix Brooks Church. Please stay with us. Welcome back, I'm Libby Casey. My next guest is Felix Brooks Church. He's the co-founder and CEO of Sanku, an organization working to combat malnutrition in Africa. Felix, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, thank you for having me. So let's talk about micronutrient malnutrition. What is it and who is most affected by it? Well, we have decades, if not centuries of evidence. If you don't have the right vitamins and minerals in your diet, you won't be strong, you won't have a strong immune system, you won't be able to fight diseases. Um, and so when you're thinking about a girl in a village in Africa that doesn't have access to these nutritious foods, she has little chance of surviving and thriving. And so globally, micronutrient deficiencies affect close to 2 billion people. And the result of that is almost 14,000 children dying every single day from preventable sickness and illness. So it's a big problem, um, but luckily we do have solutions. So your organization, Sanku, developed a small machine that can add nutrients into flour at the mills before that flour even, even goes out the door. So what is your dosifier machine and what does it do? Yeah, it's a simple machine. Um, it's about this big. Uh, I can't see my hands, but uh, we built it to really um, address the issue of what's called small scale fortification. So again, these small mills, every village might have one, every town might have a dozen, every city might have a few hundred, but collectively these small mills feed entire nations. Um, but previous to our work, there was no technology applicable for these small mills. So we set off to try to solve that solution. We designed a machine, invented really a solution um, to attach to all these hundreds of mills, thousands eventually throughout East Africa. So again, it's a small machine, it attaches directly onto that mill and it automates the process of adding these critical condensed vitamins and minerals into that flour, into that staple food that everybody eats. So you've said yourself that food fortification is a hard concept to sell. You know, millers want to make money. They need to make money. And while a mother in a village wants healthy food for her family, she may not be able to pay extra for a fortified food. So how are you addressing the cost issue? Well, it took us a while. We um, originally had a very traditional model where we gave the miller a machine to use to do the job. 
and then we tried to sell them these nutrients um, to put into that flower. So that recurring cost, we thought that they could either absorb or they could pass on to the consumer. In both cases, we were wrong. Um, and so we had to get pretty innovative and figure out, okay, how can we cover the cost of this premix? We can't just give it away because obviously that would be uh, not very sustainable and cost a lot at scale. So what we did was thought, okay, instead of trying to sell him something he doesn't want to buy, this Miller, how about we reduce the other costs, his other inputs, the other things that he needs to pay for to do his job. So we looked at empty flower bags that he needs to use, he needs to buy them, use them and pack them and sell them. And so we aggregated all our Millers together, I think about a hundred at that time, and went directly to the wholesaler of these empty flower bags, saw some economies of scale. Anyways, we're able to sell them back to the Miller plus the nutrients at the same price point as he was previously buying just empty flower bags. And so that incentivizes him because there's no additional cost. But the best result is that now in the marketplace, you have this premium product, this fortified product available to mothers right next to an un unfortified inferior product, and they both cost the same. So we're not relying on any behavioral change or putting any pressure, economic pressure on those mothers to buy. Felix, let's take a step back. Tell us about how important like corn flour is to the communities you're working in. And some might say, why not just have a more holistic diet, right? Why not diversify the types of food people are eating so they get all those nutrients naturally? Well, yeah, I mean, that second part, it's a luxury to have those those options, right? I think uh, a lot of this micronutrient malnutrition is driven to the fact that people really only have one option, um, either through behavior or availability of food. So in the case of Tanzania and East Africa, where we work, over 90% of the population consumes maize flour or corn flour as their main staple because it's cheap, it's available, and it fills you up. The problem is there's not enough nutrients, intrinsic nutrients in these uh, maize flour and these corn flour products. And so what that leads to is not necessarily starvation because their bellies might be full, but they, they are literally starving from the lack of nutrients. And it's called hidden hunger. And hidden hunger, again, kills 14,000 children every single day. Hmm. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic permeated the globe in 2020. How has it impacted the people who are dealing with malnutrition and hunger? Well, it impacted us and them as well. I think we all suffered from uh, supply chain issues. Um, you know, at scale, we need to get really good about buying vitamins and minerals from here and moving them all the way to these small mills in East Africa. Uh, and last year, we literally had containers of nutrients sitting on boats, sitting in ports, we couldn't do our job of getting better food, better nutritious food to people. We've since then sorted that out and we have better supply chain systems and stocked up, but there are so many other organizations and food processors still facing challenges. And when you have delays in the movement of food, that produces food insecurities, uh, that produces wastage. And people living at the bottom of the pyramid who are really at risk to micronutrient deficiencies, they cannot afford to waste any food. Tell us more about how the pandemic has, you know, affected how people are even just, you know, getting those bags of flour, those fortified flour, um, because in order for people to get them, of course, they've got to be going through their normal routines of of shopping and, you know, our children picking them up if they're getting them when they get home from school. How has that affected the process? Well, we haven't seen any major disruption in Tanzania, at least where we work. Um, again, all these mills are very local. They're very close to um, where people are purchasing. So there isn't a lot of supply chain uh, complexity to get that flour to them. Remember, the reason why these small mills exist where they exist in the village is literally right behind the mill is a massive cornfield. So the, the produce is produced there, it's milled there. So the challenge really was for us to enable a more robust supply chain so that we can get them those nutrients, we can get them those flour bags, also that we can send out our technicians to fix any machines. Um, and so if we're good with our supply chain, um, we don't think there will be too much disruption at the village level. So tell us more about what countries you're working in and how you're adapting to regional needs. Yeah, currently we're scaling up in Tanzania, um, already working with close to 700 millers, uh, reaching over 2 million people. And so we, Tanzania was our first kind of proof of concept. So we've proven the technology works, we've proven and tested the, the business model can scale. So this year we'll continue to scale throughout Tanzania, but we're also adding Kenya, which is right next door, the neighboring country. 
Um, in the milling sector and the consumption patterns, there's so many similarities. Unfortunately, micronutrient deficiency rates are equally high. So that's the exciting thing next year is that we're going to be able to address those, scaling our pro program, duplicating our model right across the border in Kenya. Our um, ultimate goal is to be reaching 100 million people within a decade. And to do that, we'll probably be working in five, maybe even 10 countries throughout East Africa. So let's let's break that goal down by increments. You have the goal by 2025 of, of reaching about a quarter of that 25 million people. Uh, how are you going to, to work on that scaling? Hire a lot of people, uh, build a lot of machines and get a lot of funding. So, you know, we, we definitely at this point, we're a nonprofit social enterprise. So we do rely on um, funding to help pay for operations. But unlike many other nonprofits, we do have a revenue stream from the market, from these millers. We sell them products. As we grow, um, our margins get bigger. We will reach a point where we're pretty close to self-sustainable, breaking even. At that point, we're free of philanthropy, market-driven. So that's one path to scale. The other thing is obviously we need more mills. So a lot more surveying, more surveying, we need more, more people. Uh, we need more senior level staff. Um, we estimate right now we're about 50 staff. We're gonna need about 500 at scale. So we need to build a recruiting machine as well. And all local talent, all East African talent on the ground, on the front lines. Um, so yeah, we've a lot of growth uh, as far as technology, as far as staff, as far as business models and expansion. So let's talk about climate change. You know, 2020 was one of the warmest years on record. What is the relationship between rising malnutrition levels and climate change? Yeah, there is a direct connection there, a strong one actually. And so when you think about uh, increased uh, temperatures, um, occurrences of drought and flooding, all of that puts stress on agricultural systems that creates uh, products that yield less, essentially is less food being produced. When you combine that with increased uh, carbon emissions and CO2 levels, um, that decreases the fertility of the soil. Literally, the soil doesn't produce uh, crops that are as nutritious. So now you have the issue of less food, less nutritious food. Obviously, that's going to drive uh, malnutrition. But I think there are some more indirect uh, impacts as well. So when you think about over 25% of the world's population are smallholder farmers, meaning that farmer or that family really is looking after a couple acres for their survival. Now those acres and that those crops aren't producing as much. Um, and also not only not enough for them to consume, but not enough for them to sell uh, or trade. So now you have an impact on their income. And for people mostly living on uh, under a dollar uh, a year, sorry, under a dollar a day, that's going to have huge impl implications. So now they have to make some pretty tough choices. Uh, and nutritious food costs more everywhere. So they're going to cut those out of their diet. So now they're eating less, they're eating less nutritious foods. Again, that's really just going to drive malnutrition rates high. Felix, you talked about how you're getting local millers on board. Um, how is this being communicated then to families who are, you know, getting these bags of flour? How is the conversation going about what these nutrients will do? And what is the motivation for them to make sure that they pick that if they do have a choice, let's say, of, of where they're going to buy their flour? Hmm. They absolutely do have a choice. And, you know, fortification, as you mentioned before, it's a hard concept to sell. Uh, when you talk about neuro two defects and anemia at the village level, that might be a bit too complex. So what we want to do is produce a trusted quality product. Again, we're not producing the flour, but we want our millers to do that. And so our bags speak about quality. They speak about safe, uh, nutritious products as well. And we also have the government stamp on our bags to make sure that people trust this. Again, fortification and the mandate to fortify is a national law in Tanzania and many countries in East Africa. So if the government's behind it, we want to use them also as a trust sounding board to really get that message out to the wider community. Um, and so when you're a mother in a village, now you see this product, it looks clean, it's available, uh, the government approves of it, we, we even have some nutrition wording on it. Um, we're hoping that that drives that demand. So Senko is able to monitor how the miller is using the dosifier remotely through a cellular link. Uh, tell us about how you're using technology to connect with these millers and make sure that the dosifier is working and that they're they're able to use it correctly. Mm. Yeah, well, we 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 didn't always have that. I'll put it that way. Um, it took us a while to figure out that we needed that. So we had maybe a couple hundred millers out there with with machines, and we were driving around blindly, figuring out are they using them? Are they working? 
And we thought, well, if we're going to be working with thousands of millers at scale, this is not going to work. And so we partnered with Vodafone at the time, who's a leader in IoT, in information, uh, Internet of Things. And so we installed small SIM cards in all of our machines, and that literally streams the data, the production data, over the network every five minutes to our, our laptops, to our dashboards. So we can see exactly how each mill is performing, how much flour they're producing, how much nutrients are being added, even technical issues if it's overheating or a feed screw is jamming. So we can automate technicians to go out and fix uh, these machines. Our, our number one KPI is these machines have to be working, they have to be used. Um, and so this remote monitoring really enables us to see that. So you are a former footballer and you have a varied background in things like design and geology. How did you come to, to work on this crisis of global malnutrition? Yeah, I've tried, I've tried many things, but this is definitely something that stuck. Um, it was about 14, 15 years ago, I'd been working in Cambodia, um, a very different project, not related. Um, it was a small project helping about 100 kids get off the street into school using our center as kind of a, a gateway back into the society. So after four years of doing that, I noticed um, kids had disabilities, learning disabilities, physically stunted and realized that we had gotten to them too late. What we were doing was essentially a Band-Aid. Um, and doing a little bit of research, I realized that nutrition and fortification specifically uh, was, was about prevention, getting to mothers uh, whilst they're pregnant, getting to children in those first critical thousand days. And so my co-founder uh, put out a posting, a job posting, kind of joined his crazy idea at the time um, to focus on small scale fortification and bring that solution to 100 million people. Um, and so it just sounded like the perfect opportunity that I could bring my talents, my passion to. And together we, um, we built this amazing thing. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, uh, so we'll leave it there. Uh, Felix Brooks Church, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. For more stories on how people and organizations around the world are solving our climate challenges, check out the Washington Post's Climate Solutions Content Hub at wapo.st slash climate solutions. And if you'd like to check out what interviews we have coming up, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and to find more information about all of our upcoming programs. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you so much for watching.